Okay, Veronica uh, Ramanek, I hope, is it pronounced right? We'll be giving a talk on HF Doppler observations of traveling ionospheric disturbances in the uh, WWV signal received with a network of low-cost HAMSI personal space weather stations. Uh, Veronica is a uh, KD2 at UHN, is an undergraduate student at the University of Scranton. She is headed into her junior year and is majoring in physics and Spanish. Uh, she has a strong passion for astronomy, radio physics, and is currently involved with ionospheric research. She's particularly interested in traveling ionospheric disturbances. Tids. Okay, Veronica, go ahead. Thank you very much for that nice introduction, and thank you for having me today. Um, so as Mr. Russell, Mr. Russell mentioned, today I'll be talking to you about my paper titled High Frequency Doppler Observations of Traveling Ionospheric Disturbances in a WWV Signal Received with a Network of Low-Cost Hamsi Personal Space Weather Stations. So in order to understand... Oh, um, so a brief outline of what I'll be aiming to address to you today are what are TIDs, how do we detect them, what is the Great Personal Space Weather Station, how does it work, what can we learn from the data, and how can we proceed. So in order to understand what exactly we're doing here, it's important to have a good understanding of radio waves. But radio waves can be defined as a type of electromagnetic wave that's generated by a transmitter, they're able to refract off of the ionosphere, and they can be received by receivers such as the Great Personal Space Weather Station. Because radio waves interact with the ionosphere, that makes them a great tool to study the ionosphere. And so what we're doing with the Great Personal Space Weather Station is using them to study traveling ionospheric disturbances, or TIDs. TIDs are a space weather effect that are generated by propagating gravity waves or geomagnetic activity, which disturbs the electron density in the ionosphere and creates moving wave-like irregularities of charged particles in a planet's atmosphere known as a TID. We study TIDs because they are formed by atmospheric gravity waves and can teach us about how the atmosphere of a planet breaks. They have been found on Earth and Mars, and TIDs are important to us on Earth because they can have an impact on high-frequency communications, GPS systems, and any other technology that interacts with the ionosphere. Currently, we're using the grace to um, determine their propagate, the propagation direction, wavelength, and velocity of these TIDs. So on the right here, I have a figure showing a zoomed-in version of the traveling ionospheric disturbance. And I just um, outlined here, we have the horizontal wavelength, the propagation direction, and the velocity that they're moving in, which is what we're looking to find with the grapes. So TIDs can be det detected a number of ways, including ionosons, incoherent scatter radars, GNSS systems, and high-frequency uh -huh. Doppler systems. And here on the right, I have a moving image that shows a simulation of a TID being observed by a super darn high-frequency radar. Uh, this was generated by Dr. Purcell in his 2016 paper. Um, on the right, you have the electron density. So you can notice, once I play the figure, you're going to see wave-like patterns of yellow and blue um, representing the peaks and troughs of the wave. And over here in Part B, it's a a uh, sideways image of what you're seeing here. And note how these radio paths are Doppler shifted as the TID goes by. So you see how the wave is moving and how the, uh, the wave paths are being Doppler shifted. Doppler shift can be defined as an apparent change in frequency when there is a relative motion between a source and an observer. In this case, the relative motion is referring to the traveling ionospheric disturbance. As the wave moves downwards or towards the Earth, the refracted radio wave is Doppler shifted and is recorded as a positive frequency change. And as the wave moves upwards or away from Earth, the refracted radio wave is Doppler shifted and recorded as a negative frequency change. 
And in a few slides, I'll show you some graphs uh, that have been generated by the grapes that give a very good example of how we can see the software shift. So this is a figure that was created by Christina Collins. It's also available to see on the HamSci website. And I just wanted to include this because it shows how when the path length increases, radio, um, the received radio frequency decreases. And as the path length decreases, the received frequency increases. So the source of the radio waves that we're looking at in uh, using the grapes is from WWV. I'm sure all you hands out there have heard of WWV before, but just in case, um, WWV is a National Institute of Standards and Technology Time Standard Station. It's located near Fort Collins, Colorado. It transmits on extremely accurate frequencies, and it outputs 2.5 megahertz, 5 megahertz, 10 megahertz, 15 megahertz, 20 megahertz, and 25 megahertz signals. And we are actively using the 10 megahertz frequency. On the right, this is a picture of the 15 megahertz WWV antenna. Um, this is practically identical to the 10 megahertz antenna. I couldn't find one of those for public use, so I included the 15, but they're practically the same. So there are currently 15 groups set up and running across the United States. And for the explanation of the setup of the grapes, we're going to look closely at one of the grapes. This is one is actually located at my house or the call sign KD2UHN, which is in northwestern New Jersey. And this image on the right shows a map of the grape circle path between WWV and KD2UHN. And just note, due to the distortions of a two-dimensional map, this line appears a little bit crooked. But this is um, WWV near Fort Collins, Colorado. And this is my house in northwestern New Jersey. So what is the grape? The grape was developed by the Ham Radio Science Citizen Investigation, HAMSI, by people at Case Western Reserve University. And it is a small measurement platform that can be used to make ground-based observations of the space environment. For reference, I have a picture of it here on the right. Um, a few slides from now, I'm going to give more detail about how exactly it works. So the antenna that I currently have set up at my house is the Op Center Fed or OCF dipole antenna. Uh, the OCF dipole antenna has a low voltage standing wave ratio across the high frequency band. It doesn't require much tuning and it has a good match to the transmitter. Um, this type of antenna has a dipole that is not fed at its center and we selected it because it is an inspect inexpensive multiband antenna that is easy to install. So on the right here, I have this image courtesy of Daniel Bateman from Buckmaster International. And this shows the orientation of the OCF dipole antenna. The setup that I'm using is relatively between this 150 and 180 degree angle of the wires coming out of it. So this is a schematic on the left-hand side of the setup that I'm using at my house. So on the roof here at point A is the antenna feed point. And then B and C are the uh, wires that are connected to trees near my house. And then coming out of point A here, there's a coaxial cable that goes through my roof, through my wall, and connects to the grapes in my room. And so the way that the grape works is it's constantly monitoring the 10 megahertz signal from WWV. Here is a picture of the coaxial cable that connects to the antenna on my roof. Simultaneously, we have this GPS antenna over here that is monitoring signals from GPS satellite. Both of these connect to the GPS DO, which is this gray box in the back here. And this uses signals to produce a very stable 9.99 .99 megahertz output. And then this output is sent to the receiver board over here, where it mixes the um, signal to produce a signal of 1 kilohertz. This signal gets sent as an analog signal over to the sound card, where it's digitized, and then sent to the Raspberry Pi 4B, where it analyzes the signal using the popular FL Digi frequency analysis software. And then at zero UTC, or universal time, each day, the grape produces and saves a figure displaying what was seen that day. 
So this is an example of one of those figures. Dr. Risso um, showed this briefly in his presentation. So on the top, we have some data that notates which grape the data is coming from and the day that the data is from. On the bottom, we have the universal time and hours to show the progression of the day. On the left-hand side is the um, annotations for the black line, which shows the Doppler shift. And on the right-hand side, we have the annotations for the red line, which shows the signal shrimp. For our purposes, we're not too interested in the red line. We're mostly looking at what we can learn from the black line. Um, but you see here I have a screen box, which outlines the sinusoidal oscillation. And this oscillation can be attributed to a TID. So if you recall, as I mentioned, as the um, ionosphere moves upwards and downwards, the Doppler shift will move downwards and upwards, respectively. And you can see here how this uh, carrier frequency has been Doppler shifted. So what I did was I went through about a month's worth of data, and I manually picked out periods of 15 minutes in amplitudes of about 25, point, sorry, 0.25 hertz. And I um, noted those as active hours for traveling ion sphere disturbances. So I have some examples of some quiet days. Days where we see some oscillations, but they don't fit the criteria we were looking for when picking out TIDs. There's maybe one at the end here, but overall this day is pretty quiet. Again here, we have another quiet day. Here we have a pretty active day. So you can see there's some very clear oscillations that fit the period and amplitude we are looking for. Something I would like to point out is around the middle of each uh, day you see this peak and around the end you see this dip. This peak can be attributed to the sunrise and this dip can be attributed to the sunset. And the reason for that is because the sun, uh, light from the sun ionizes particles in the atmosphere. So when the sun rises there's more sunlight for that to happen. And similarly, when the sun sets, there's less sun, and so the particles recombine into neutral particles, so the ionosphere sends out. So this is a video. Um, this was generated by Christina Collins um, at Case Western Reserve University. It's also available on the HAMSAI website. And this video shows a year's worth of data. Um, of this actually is of the 2.5 megahertz Doppler shift. And you can see how the peak changes as the year goes on. So it's moving to the right. OK, so we have this map here again. And this time, there's a green star. And the reason for this is because even though the grape is located in the eastern time zone, we're interested in studying where the wave refracts off of the ionosphere, which happens in the central time zone. So here on the top, I have the central time zone specified up here. On the left-hand side, I have uh, the days that I looked at. and. As I mentioned before, I went through about a month's worth of data, and I looked for active hours or hours where we saw those oscillations. Anytime we did see an active hour, I highlighted that in green and labeled it as a one. And anytime we saw a quiet hour or an hour without an oscillation, I left that as white, and I labeled it as a zero. And on the bottom, you could see the totals per hour, and any day or any hour that had over half of the days of active hours I highlighted in bold green. And so far, this distribution of data is suggesting periods of higher activity between 15 and 20 midpoint local time, which is the central time zone. So then I took all of that data and I uh, plotted it on a graph to see a different orientation. And on the left hand side, we have the observed hours. On the bottom, we have the midpoint local time or the central time zone. And we see that. This orientation of data distribution also suggests increased activity between 15 and 20 midpoint local time. So a recap of what we've done so far. So the great, in uh, the great personal space weather station in Northwest New Jersey 
is actively collecting data and generating graphs. <laughs> Excuse me. The group is making observations consistent with those expected of traveling ionospheric disturbances. And so far, we see CIDs appear to be more prevalent during 15 to 20 midpoint multiple times. So as I mentioned, we are trying to use these groups to determine the TID wavelength, propagation direction, and velocity. So to do that, we need to look at data from a few different groups. So this is the setup that we're looking at right now. Again, we have WWV out here in Colorado. Over in Ohio, near Case Western Reserve University, there's a great setup there. There's one set up again at my house here at KD2UHN, and then there's one in northeastern New Jersey. This isn't the ideal setup. Ideally, we would have these set up as a triangle. These are more of a line, but so far they've been working for what we're trying to do. And so I have some data here from the various scrapes that we have set up. So this one is from NAOBJ, located out in Colorado. And you see in this green box, I have highlighted a very clear TID, the very big oscillation from April 7th to 2021. The same TID appears at KD2UHN, or my house, on the same day. And we see it again in the Doppler shifted carrier frequency recorded by the grapes in, at NJIT in Northeastern New Jersey. So here, I line them up so you could really see uh, the similarity between the TIDs. And, um, and what we're going to do is uh, perform a cross-correlation on TIDs like this one to better determine the TID wavelength and propagation direction. So I found this video courtesy of Burton's technology on YouTube. And I thought they did a very good job um, kind of showing and describing how cross-correlation works. And it really provides a, some good vi visualization. So um, I included it in here. Cross correlation is a measure of similarity of two series as a function of the lag of one relative to the other. It is defined by this formula. I'm not sure that I shared my sound. Sounds good. I can hear it. <laughs> Where x Where and y is, is a function of time t, tau is the time delay. It can be negative, zero, or positive. R is the cross correlation, which is a function of the time delay tau. When x equals to y, then the cross correlation becomes auto correlation. This animation shows auto correlation process of a cycle of a sine wave. As you can see, the peak of autocorrelation function is reached when the time delay tau is zero. That is, when the two sine waves are aligned precisely with each other on the time axis. This autocorrelation function has only one peak and two troughs. Its width doubles that of the sine pulse. This animation shows autocorrelation process of a sine wave with a limited length. Again, the peak of autocorrelation function is reached when the time delay tau is zero. That is, when the two sine waves are aligned precisely with each other on the time axis. This autocorrelation function has many peaks and troughs. The time interval between two adjacent peaks equals to the period of the signal. Basically, the autocorrelation function of a periodic signal is also periodic. The width of the autocorrelation function doubles that of the length of the sine wave itself. The dwindling of the correlation function at both the negative and positive ends is due to the time window of the sine wave. The data outside the time window or sampling window are assumed to be zero during the correlation calculation. This animation shows the autocorrelation process of a white noise with a limited length. Again, the peak of autocorrelation function is reached when the time delay tau is zero. That is, when the two white noise waves are aligned precisely with each other on the time axis. This autocorrelation function has only one peak and the rest parts of the correlation curve are nearly zero, 
meaning that different parts of the white noise are uncorrelated. The single... All right. So I think that um, shows pretty nicely what we're trying to do here. So instead of these two signals, we would be looking at signals, um, the Doppler-shifted carrier frequencies that we received with the grapes, and we would be trying to see the correlation between the TIDs. What is cross-correlation? Okay. So to do this, we look at the raw data. And so in intervals of one second, the grape is actively collecting frequency and voltage data. Over here on the right, I have an example of some of the data from one of the days. This data is from the grape at NJIT. And you could see it stores the universal time, uh, the date time here for every one second interval. There's also frequency data, or the black line, and uh, peak voltage data, or the red line. Sometimes the group doesn't record some of the time values um, or any data for the time values. Um, we think that's because of the way FLDG is processing the data. Um, they're actively working to fix that. But because of that, we have to resample and interpolate the data. Also, if the antenna is disconnected, or if the power goes out at the location of the, of the grape, um, it won't have any valuable frequency or voltage data for that time frame. So this is an example of some of my resampled and interpolated data from April 7th this year at KB2UHN. The orange stars depict the resampled data in increments of one second, and it's plotted over a blue line that represents the raw data plotted on the same graph. And you can see how resampling and interpolating the data affects some of the missing data points. So where do we aim to go from here? So currently, we are working to build upon a method used by Claire Trope at Dartmouth. And this method entails detecting TIDs, performing a sliding normalized cross-correlation, looking for regions with stationary lag and good normalization, determining the phase velocity, wavelength, and propagation direction by considering the lags for each um, respective region. And then we're going to do that uh, exploring two methods. One of them is a method that involves this, um, looking at the phase velocity and direction method. The other would be the sine and circle fit method. So a summary of what I've talked about today. So using radio waves, we are looking for PIDs to study them. We currently have a network of grape receivers set up across the country. The grape at KD2 UHN is attached to an OCF skypoint antenna, and it is actively monitoring the 10 megahertz WWV transmission. The grape consists of a GPS antenna, a GPS CO, a receiver board, a sound card, and a Raspberry Pi 4B. The grape automatically outputs a plot showing the Doppler shifted frequency data collected that day. The data that contributes to those graphs is being resampled and interpolated. And then from there, we'll look at the data to identify TIDs within that data. And a method will be developed to determine the TID phase velocity, wavelength, and propagation direction. So these are my acknowledgments. And these are some of my references. And again, thank you for having me today. And if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Excellent, Veronica. Uh, Doug Manchester had a question. You want to go ahead and ask Doug? Yeah, I was uh, I was curious if the TID would show up during tropo ducting. Um, it's an unusual side question because I, if you live in a community with uh, lots of uh, antenna controls and stuff, you tend to move towards six meter, two meter, and that kind of stuff. And when you get tropo ducting, it's great. Um, your subsequent slide showing the plus and minus quarter hertz uh, suggests that probably it wouldn't be detectable in tropo ducting, but has that been looked at at all? Um, to my knowledge, it hasn't been. I know I haven't looked into that. Um, I'm not entirely familiar with tropo ducting. Um, Dr. Fursell might actually have a better uh, explanation. Okay, I see in the chat he says, I don't think so, but I don't think it's been looked at. Yeah. Okay. I, I wouldn't be surprised in retrospect. Thank you. Sounds like Excellent a great presentation, by the way. 
<laughs> yeah, excellent. Uh, yeah, that sounds like a graduate project there, Veronica. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, uh, I don't see other questions. But, so, Veronica, um, when are you signing up for your uh, PhD program? Well, I'm currently going into my junior year at Scranton, so I have some time before that, but hopefully soon I can start looking at grad schools and see where to go from here. I, I think you're a, you're a hit for grad school, and uh, don't let anybody tell you you can't do it. Just uh, just do it. And, uh, well, thank you very much. <laughs> oh, I think you're uh, excellent. And uh, feel free to join the Sarah group. Uh, and uh, we, we, there's all sorts of people here that uh, would, would love to hear from a new, a new uh, young person that uh, has all new ideas. So, uh, well, thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Veronica.